Hey, Kelly, uh, one thing we've been watching and that we're going to talk about next week on First Liberty Live is what's happening in California uh, with the churches there and the pronouncements coming out. Give us a preview of what's happening and uh, what we might be talking about next week. Well, what's happening is a lot of chaos. Um, the governor has uh, gone one direction and the other um, has really engaged in a lot of fairly outrageous conduct. Um, I mean, uh, things as uh, as weird as, as telling the uh, secretary of state uh, who was going to go and speak at one of the churches not to come. Uh, I mean, so, uh, you know, of shutting down every church from any indoor services and then telling them that they're not allowed to have singing. Um, uh, some of the, uh, although the state allows it, uh, some of the local counties have actually told churches that they can't even hold services outside, which is, you know, ridiculous because the protests were fine outside. Uh, so, you know, thousands of people screaming and yelling and, and, uh, uh, at the top of their lungs, that's that's okay. But uh, you know, people meeting outside to sing uh, worship songs, well, that's that's over the line. Well, that that's clear discrimination. So there's been a number of lawsuits filed in different aspects of what the governor has done to really put a, put the clamps on the church, and that'll be tested. And we are talking to a number of churches. We're actually representing a number of the biggest churches in the country that are out there, trying to work on things behind the scenes before it becomes public. Uh, but look, a lot of these pastors want to cooperate. They, they want to they want to do everything they can, but they're really not being given an option. And if they want to be a church and actually get together in a safe way, um, they're having to challenge the abuse and overreach uh, that's occurring at the government. Is it your impression that there are those in government positions who are using the COVID-19 crisis as a stratagem to try to put churches in their place, to, to push them back uh, out of the public square a little bit? Is that what you think we're seeing? You know, it's hard. You don't know people's motivation. Um, either either it's one of two things. Either they are hostile to the church. You know, they, they literally like putting their thumbs uh, on the church. When, because they, I say that because they treat the church uh, differently than they do other uses that are very similar. Um, so it's either that they're they're hostile or they just have no understanding or respect for not only the church, but for the Constitution, uh, because, you know, it, it reminds me of a lot of these essential services. You know, churches are not essential, but the marijuana dispensary is, dispens is essential. Um, they don't understand what's really essential. I mean, the spiritual life of people, their mental health. Um, you know, the depression, the, the issues that the church solves uh, in really making people's lives meaningful, uh, that actually is the most material uh, thing in life. You know, when you think about America, you don't think the most important things is what you can put your hands on. You think the most important things are things like freedom and liberty and courage and honor. And uh, so these governors, I think, just are clueless about what really matters and what truly is essential in life. And the, the role and the place of the church is absolutely not just essential, it's crucial uh, to what America is. Kelly, I'd like to go ahead and turn the corner and, and move to the topic that we're going to discuss today. For those of you just joining us, we're waiting for Representative Doug Collins of Georgia to join us here and talk to us about religious freedom in the military. And but while we're waiting for him to get here, it's not surprising uh, if you're on Capitol Hill for things to run a little behind schedule wise. So we'll, we'll give him a few more minutes to join us. But in the meantime, I wanted to ask you uh, about this topic. It's something that First Liberty has been active in. And for those of you who don't know, Kelly Shackelford is the president, CEO and chief counsel of First Liberty Institute. I'm Stuart Shepard. I'm the host of First Liberty Live and, and also uh, the official title is multimedia director, but people just call me the video guy because it's simpler <laughs> to say. But, Kelly, uh, members of the military, they swear an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, including that part about the free exercise of religion. But there are some high up in the military uh, who are actively placing restrictions on expressions of faith by chaplains and other service members. And this is something that we've been seeing. We just had a case with the Navy that I'd like for you to unpack for us a bit. Tell us what happened and what the solution was. 
Yeah, this goes way back. And by the way, it's it's, it's why it's so great to have uh, Congressman Collins on today. I mean, what a unique situation. You've got a guy who is a Baptist minister, a lawyer, and a chaplain in the armed forces. I mean, and a congressman. So he's the perfect guy, uh, as I see him coming on. <laughs> He's the perfect guy to talk about this. Uh, and what we've been seeing has been real, real disturbing. Uh, what happened with the Navy was outrageous. Uh, um, you know, that I, I, again, uh, uh, Congressman Collins will probably want to talk about that. What, what happened during COVID with the chaplains and now this new situation with the Marines, it, it really is outrageous what's been going on. And the important thing is those who are serving us in the military, they're in a, an authorita uh, authoritarian structure. They, they can't like buck the system, right? So if other people don't come and, and insist that their freedoms not be taken away, uh, they're standing alone. And what, what a tragedy that the people who are fighting for our freedoms, when they're under attack, if we didn't come and, and get their back. And so that's why I'm so grateful for people like Congressman Collins and glad he could be here. Congressman, can you hear us? Okay. I hear you fine, hope you can hear me. Awesome. Yeah. Clear as a bell. I, think I was watching for a while instead of being a participant. So I, think <laughs> I was here and they said, well, he's not here. And I said, well, you know, are we talking theologically or are we? <laughs> no, 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 we're here. We're we here. are all figuring this out. So uh, you get grace before you even start there. Thank you for making time for us today. Really appreciate it. Let me give you a formal introduction to everybody. Uh, our guest today is a vocal supporter of the rights of service members. It is U.S. Representative Doug Collins of Georgia. He's uh, been representing the district there for seven years, I think. Is that right, Val? Seven and a half. He's also an attorney and a U.S. Air Force Reserve chaplain with the rank of lieutenant colonel and uh, holds a degree from a, a Christian college. And we are grateful to have him as our guest today. And I've already introduced Kelly, so Kelly, you don't get introduced twice. Sorry about that. <laughs> hey, Congressman, earlier this month, uh, you and your House colleague, Doug Lamborn, wrote a letter, uh, a strongly worded letter to the Secretary of Defense, Mark, uh, uh, Mike, uh, Secretary of Defense, Mike Esper. This sentence sums it up, quote, the DOD has either willfully ignored or is unaware of its obligations to protect the religious freedom of its service members. What changes were you looking for and what has happened since you wrote that letter? Well, number one, I think it's both. I think they willfully uh, ignore and I think sometimes they don't understand. And I think this is a problem that we have seen on, on several levels of going through this because for me, this is not my first you know, exercise in having to deal with uh, the DOD and, and the different branches dealing with religious liberties. It's been going back several, you know, since I've been in Congress. And, you know, the one thing that makes me a little bit different different in having to deal with these issues or getting to deal with these issues is that I am an active uh, chaplain. I've been a chaplain for 19 years in, in, in Air Force Reserves. I served in Iraq. I've been a wing chaplain. I, I've covered the gamut. Now I'm actually uh, still uh, signed actively to uh, headquarters Africa at Warner Robins. So, uh, but also take that and then accompany it with the fact that I'm an attorney as well gives me the capabilities to talk about it. And we've been fighting. What I believe is happening here, and it's, I try to, as you said earlier, give grace. And part of that grace is you have middle level officers who are very scared of threats of lawsuits. They're very scared of, they will, they will err on, get this off of my desk before they'll err on the side of maybe digging in and finding out what the DOD or the actual things actually say. So we're the ones that actually step in here. And the interesting thing is, I can't think of a case so far that has not been profiled that we, people have heard about in which we've lost. I mean, we've actually, you know, stood up for these chaplains. We stood up in the chain of commands in the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and we and we've won. Mickey Weinstein just enjoys uh, attacking the chaplaincy, and he has for many years. Um, and the unfortunate part, what's more concerning to me, is the JAG Corps and the Chaplain Corps and the in the manner how he has direct access to what I'll call you know, battalion level or lower commanders. He's, he sort of left the Pentagon and went straight to these commanders sending these threatening emails, and yet they just fold. And the latest example, the Marine example, simply was a censorship of an individual because of his Christian beliefs. And, and that, that was the model. I was going to ask you about it. Describe that, that situation, who it was that was going to speak at that training event and how he was kicked out. Yeah, Ms. Lorenzo, who is a part of Campus Crusade for Christ and crew now, as they, as they know themselves, was giving a, a, 
a, th a talk on the battlefield at, at Gettysburg, talking about leadership examples at Gettysburg. Now, this is a gentleman who is very familiar with the military. He knows from a chaplain perspective, he knows what he could and could not say. Um, and it was a, the mandatory part was simply the National Park video on, on Gettysburg itself. And then there was some optional videos if they wanted to watch those as well. Someone tipped off Mickey that this was his, that, which again has a history with Mr. Lorenzo and others, that they have tipped off that this case, the course is going to be taught by him. Mickey went off, as he always does, sent an email to uh, the Marine Corps. Uh, within 64 minutes, they fold. 64 minutes. Let's think about that for a second. Most people can't get the Pentagon unless in a time of war, and I'm a member of the military. I wish I could get my orders approved in 64 minutes. I wish I could get my pay dockets done in 54 minutes. It, it didn't happen, but they sent him back a note saying, all taken care of. I mean, that's, again, no investigation, no nothing. And what we found out was, is they came to see me about it, and they said, well, the course title was Gettysburg and Biblical Examples of Leadership. The interesting part, I think that was the way it was titled, when we did a little bit more digging, those were on his bio, not the course title and not on the tick on the TikTok sheet for the day's events on the training for the Jags. So again, they went off of a bio, not the, which then is to me more condemning of not only the Marine Corps, but also of the of Mickey Weinstein, that they went after him because of his political, uh, his, not only his, not his political, but his religious faith. And that's the impression it leaves is he wasn't rejected because of the curriculum. He was rejected because he's a Christian. And you saw Mickey change his story several times. It seems like with the Fox News actually called him about this, he would talk about, well, it was a, it was a mandatory class. And when confronted, you could see in the article, well, it wasn't mandatory, but, and then you find, and then finally he just came out and said it, it was in his bio. I mean, can we be more hypocritical here? Um, well, I guess with Mickey, probably not. But, um, you know, that's just, it's just, we, that's why we got to fight for these things. That's why, I'm, look, if there had been, and I'm going to say this publicly, if it had been a, a command mandatory class that had biblical examples of leadership from X, I as a chaplain would have raised my hand to my battalion or my wing and said, mm, sir, you may need to think about this. And I believe that chaplains, when we do our job right, protect the rights of every belief, including those who have no belief. And there are things that we can understand. Mickey just wants no belief. And that one of the things that struck me about this as I read through the description of it from the other side, for what it's worth, is they made it sound like people in the military are essentially defenseless against ideas that are different than their own. But I don't think that's true of, of any of us as Americans. Surely we can hear, even if it had happened, another point of view without just suddenly being proselytized against our will. I mean, that's just silly to even think about. It is amazing. The argument from the other side is the most condescending argument really ever made that they, oh, they really don't know what they're doing or if they were happen to be forced into something, which they're not forced into, you know, it would be detrimental to their life. And that's just not happening. It's not true. In fact, it shows the value they believe in people. We believe in people. They don't. I, in the letter, you brought up a distinction that might be helpful to unpack. You wrote that the complaints to the military and this is a quote, refuse to see the difference between evangelizing and proselytizing. Describe the difference and why it's important. Well, I think what you got to look at doing is, is all of us are, are part of our faith. And I'm going to be very chaplain-esque here. All have a faith that we believe in, that we believe others probably would benefit from. That's the, you know, it loosely turned evangelizing or, or knowing who we are and that we would want others to join our faith. Proselytizing is actually coercion or, in, or coercion probably is the strongest term that Mickey would want to use. It is sharing that faith, actively recruiting others in a way to join your faith. Uh, there's a very fine line in that being who you are is fully protected among, and even in the military, as to who we are with our faith actively taking that other step over is not because of the way the military is structured, especially from a chaplain perspective and others. But there is a line on what I can say and what I cannot say. The DOD falls too far on the line of, we'd prefer you just not even discuss faith at all. Well, that's like me saying, take off my glasses and read uh, my briefing book today. I, I can't do it. Um, so faith for me is like my glasses. It's the way I see life. I will, no matter where I'm at, I will, give people advice or talk to them because of the way my faith colors my vision. What they're trying to do and, and what is very much a real is that's fine. That should be protected. But what is not protected, especially in a military or closed environment where structure and rank are there, 
is this idea that you've got to wear my glasses. And if you don't, you know, then there's something wrong with you and it could affect your performance and everything else. That's the big difference that, that again, the military will just divert to, I don't want to deal with this. Kelly, I see you nodding along here. First Liberty has taken more than a few cases in this area into the courts and won. What do you tell people about this? What's the single most important thing they need to know about this topic? Well, I mean, I think Congressman Collins talked about it, which is you just got to be willing to stand up. We've won every single one of these. I mean, I think some people are probably asking, hey, where's Mike Berry, right? Our general counsel, who's a lieutenant colonel. He's actually on reserve duty right now, which is why he's not here. But yeah. we, every single time we've had any of these cases, uh, we've won every single one of these military cases where they've tried to shut down the chaplains or whatever. So it's just necessary that they stand up. And one you asked about earlier, and I want to give kudos to uh, Congressman Collins on this, was the Navy. This just happened recently. They, they literally had an order telling everyone who served in the Navy that they were not allowed to go to any in-person religious service. I mean, they couldn't go to church ever. Anyway, it didn't matter how small, didn't matter how many people, didn't matter how safe, didn't matter where it was. They were banned. Now, meanwhile, you know, you were allowed to go to a, one of these protests that were going on you were allowed to have a house party and bring all kinds of strangers into your house it was it was crazy um and we uh, broke the story with fox and then immediately congressman collins uh, we had you know people in the navy all over the country saying hey i i've been banned from church forever and and it's by the way you you could in, it, it was enforceable by court martial so this is a serious deal what was going on as soon as congressman collins and others got a hold of this uh, it was almost as fast as uh, 20, uh, you know, 54 minutes. It was like a week. Uh, there was a reversal of that order. And now everybody in the Navy is allowed to go to a safe church. Uh, but that's the kind of thing that's been happening. And that just happened just a few weeks ago. And it's, it's so, before Congressman Collins was there, we just didn't have that kind of support. And, uh, and it's making a big difference in turning a lot of these things around where we don't even have to file a lawsuit it gets turned around because it's exposed and those DOD officials come before his committee. Uh, you know, they'd like to make sure they're following the law because he might uh, have some things to say to them. For those of you watching, we want to make sure that you're knowledgeable about this issue of religious freedom in the military. So we have a, a booklet. It's our gift to you uh, for being part of this today. Uh, it's called Faith and Freedom uh, and it deals with force multipliers in America's military. And it's a free downloadable item. There's no cost for it at all. Uh, just go to firstliberty.org slash faith dash and dash freedom. And the link will be in the summary that goes with this, uh, this particular video. And you can download that and print it out or share it with your friends, whatever you'd like to do. We want people to be knowledgeable about this issue so we can all engage in conversations based on facts, not on what the latest opinion poll is showing out there. I've got a question for both of you now that I'd like to toss out. There's a larger issue that's part of this, and I want to get your thoughts on it. There are times when members of the military are required to make decisions that have deep moral and spiritual implications. And the decision maker in that situation then has to rely on some set of guiding principles, something that's inside them to help them make the choice, sometimes in a split second, sometimes over the course of weeks, whatever the time window may be, it's going to have a huge impact on the lives of others somewhere in the world. In that moment, it really makes a difference what those principles are, doesn't it? Uh, I would say so, yes. Um, you know, again, the most principled people in the world are also what I have found is some of the most also uh, understanding people in the world. And hear me when I say that. I'm not worried about somebody taking my beliefs. I know what I believe. I understand why I believe. Um, and from a faith perspective, that is as rock solid as it gets. So what is interesting for me when I come to those decisions in which I may be dealing with others, I, I view my job here as a congressman. My greatest uh, work is yes for my district back in, in Georgia and the whole state of Georgia and in Congress, but I actually have a smaller uh, work field and that is the folks who work for me. And so, you know, a lot of times they may or may not believe like I do or the folks who come into my office to visit with me, but if they challenge me, I'm not worried about my principles. I can listen to their differences and then speak from what I know. And I think that's the biggest thing for, for folks is to, is to believe what you believe, have faith in what you believe, 
and not be challenged or scared of others. In fact, actually be able to, to say what you believe. And that is the essence of, of someone having moral beliefs, because if you don't have those, then you're going to be uh, concerned every time when confronted with a decision like you've made. And those are the biggest uh, you know, hindrances to many times people of faith or people of just regular moral conviction is they don't know what they believe. So they're challenged and they don't want to be challenged. And, and you've hit on something that, that I've seen over and over again, especially where you work, Congressman, and that is if you operate based on principle, it allows you to disagree with someone but still maintain a friendship with them, even if they're directly in opposition to your position on the issues, because they know you're going to act on principle, they're not afraid of you. There's no reason for fear and, and yelling at each other. You can just disagree based on principles. Do you see that on Capitol Hill? I wish I could see it more. Um, in fact, right now, unfortunately, the body politic actually discourages it. And that's, and that's, and that's bad. Um, you know, look, I, I vehemently disagree with many of my Democratic colleagues, vehemently disagree. I will fight to have them beaten by one of my party. I, I, don't, I don't agree. But if we can find an agreement point, then I'll take that agreement point and see if we can help them, you know, help Americans. Uh, and I'm not ashamed of that. I will do that because I believe our job is to help all of this country. I believe God has given us the greatest gift in the world of this government and this country, and we're supposed to be helping people. Um, but when you get into the point to where every idea, you just immediately go evil and evil, then you lose all context of actually trying to help people. And I think that's, uh, you know, it goes against those of us who have the moral principle that God, in from my perspective, uh, created us all. Um, we and, and knowing that that should give us a higher calling to at least find agreement in areas where we can. Now, the fight where we can't, don't back up. And I'll never back up on those principles. But we can find an agreement. But it, it's, it should be more than we found here. It was found in our founding fathers. Why can't it be found now? Kelly, yes. what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, what what it, I was just thinking the very opposite of what Congressman Collins just described is the cancel culture. This idea that, uh, I mean, I consider the cancer culture people cowards because they can't handle an open discussion. They're scared to death that they don't have the truth and they will lose the discussion. And so they wanna bully the other side into not speaking. I can't think of anything more anti-American than that. The marketplace of ideas, the belief that through everybody's ideas coming together that we get the best ideas, is, is you know the very core of America and what what is being attempted now around the country and we see it especially politicized with Congress is this attempt to shut down your opponent to not allow them to speak to try to bully them to fire people out of their jobs it's a really horrible cancer and uh, it's going to require people of courage to stand up and say that's not acceptable in this country and you're never going to intimidate me from speaking the truth and uh, so it it it, exactly what he's saying is the antidote, uh, but uh, we've got to realize right now, I think more than ever in our life, we've got something trying to do exactly the opposite of that. And I think people recognize it. And I, I really believe Americans don't like what they're seeing. And I, I, I'm hopeful they're going to respond uh, in lots of different ways. Uh, and I would just encourage us to pray for Doug, pray for Congressman Collins, uh, He's in a, in a difficult situation fighting for these right positions. He's even in a race for U.S. Senate. I think the last I saw, you were polling number one. There's like four people running. So pray for him. Uh, we need good people of faith uh, standing for us that have courage. And what he's been doing for us with the military has been just uh, phenomenal. And we're very grateful for all you're doing, Congressman. Congressman, one last question for you before we let you go. What do you see is the biggest threat to religious freedom in the United States today as we're talking about this right now? Very easy, complacency. Complacency is the, is the greatest enemy right now of the religious liberties in our military, in our business place, but also frankly, it's the biggest uh, hindrance in our churches as well. And we can't let go of what we have been given. It was fought for and paid for with the blood of those Those who have fought for this country. Or I won't worry about this attack here. It was just a, it, you know, it was just a Bible study. It was just uh, something else. Then I think that's the part that we really got to, uh, 
worry about. So for me, the biggest fear is not the law. The law's on. We have great folks like Kelly and First Liberty and others who fight with us. But what I'm afraid of more than anything else is, frankly, the complacency of people to think that won't happen. And I've heard it more and more. When I talk about what goes on sometimes, they look at me and say, well, that, that can't be happening because we cloister ourselves too many times in our churches and our Christian organizations, and we don't hear what is going on outside. And for those of us who actually get out there and, and hear what and see what those fears look like, I will tell you, it is a battle. We're, we're, we have got to get out into the battle and, and complacency cannot be part of what we do. All right. Hey, thank you for making time for us today. It's a, it's a pleasure to get to hear your thoughts. Very insightful. We're going to be chewing on, on what you said for quite a while. Really appreciate uh, the work that you're doing there on Capitol Hill. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, Kelly. It's good to see you as always. Y'all take care and thanks for everybody who participated today. Thanks a bunch. Right. We will let you duck out. We know you got a busy schedule. Kelly, if you'll stick around, we'll talk just a little bit more. Uh, we want to talk about it now here at the end of the program, uh, our friend Coach Kennedy. His case has been going on for a while. Sometimes when you watch TV or movies, you get the impression that people go to court and things are solved in 20 minutes and then it's all over. Well, in, in, in real life, it, it's a little bit longer than that. Uh, these things can go on for years. And Coach Joe Kennedy has been, has been in the fight for a long time now. But uh, we just had a, a big step in his court case that happened here in this past week. Kelly, tell us what just happened and where it may lead. Well, what happened is we're, we're now going to the next level um, to give people the quick summary, because it's hard to, for I know for everybody to keep up with what's been going on here. Um, we, we filed this. This is, of course, Coach Kennedy, who was fired for going to a knee by himself and saying a silent prayer after the football game when everybody else was meeting and, and slapping hands and backs at the center of the field. Uh, he was fired and uh, we went. Uh, in a court, they, they, they ruled against him. We went to the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit is known, San Francisco, known for being the most liberal court of appeals in the country at the time. And they ruled that coaches were not allowed to pray in public if anyone could see them, and which is just a ridiculous uh, uh, attempt to, to come up with, you know, what they think the law is now. We went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court didn't take it, but the four conservative justices sent a, a concurrence down saying, go back down there's some things need to be factually developed. And then they said they found the decision below, quote, very troubling and asked that we sort of get everything together, come back up. We've now done that. Uh, and now we're going back up to the Ninth Circuit and saying the law is not that coaches are not allowed to pray in public. I mean, that is not the United States of America. That's not what the Constitution says. So we just filed our brief uh, in the Ninth Circuit. Uh, as many people know, the Ninth Circuit has been dramatically changing under President Trump. Uh, at the time, at the beginning, it was sort of 19 liberals, 10 conservatives. Now it's, uh, it's almost even. And uh, so, so things could change. We'll see. So I would encourage people to pray for Coach Kennedy. This has been a long battle. But he's standing there, as he told us, he said, look, I understand what the fourth quarter is and I understand what overtime is. This game ain't over and we plan to win and uh, he's in for the long haul, but pray for him. It's been a, a difficult, I know with the oral argument, he was real emotional. You could tell this has been wearing on him because it's been a long time. Pray for him, pray for the judges uh, and uh, pray that God's will be done. Now we, you know, we hope we win at the ninth circuit, but if we don't, we're going back to the Supreme court. And if they want to set us up for a great victory at the Supreme court, and that's what God wants, we want that too. So uh, be, be praying, keep this in your prayers and watch it. We will keep you updated as to what happens. It's often easy for us when we hear about these cases, but we think because we, we think in terms of the person that's the focal point of the case, we think, boy, it'd be great if Coach Kennedy got that right to, to be able to pray silently at the 50-yard line after a game. But the victory isn't just for him. No. What may this do for people in public life life all across the country if it is a victory at the Supreme Court. What, what are we looking forward to uh, if, when we get to win that? Well, what's, what's amazing, this is why Coach Kennedy is doing this. It's not for him. It's for everybody else. I mean, number one, every coach would now be freed to be who they are, uh, you know, with their faith and to not be persecuted in any way. It would, it would make clear that they are now open. And I mean, the last thing we really want to do is exclude all the coaches who are people of faith. 
Uh, I mean, everybody's hoping they get a coach like Coach Kennedy for their kids. And when you get them, and those are the people you have to push out, uh, it's, it, our society is going to turn upside down. But that's just the beginning. It's, it, it would affect everybody, not just your coaches, everybody who works at a school, everybody who works at any government entity. Because what this decision is saying is essentially if you work for the government, you lose your religious freedoms. And if you pray, even silently, even by yourself, you can be fired. Uh, so this would open up freedom for everybody who serves in that way. But I think even more than that, it would be the first expansion. You know, we won the Bladensburg Cross case, which talked about these, these bizarre separation of, of church and state arguments that are not in the Constitution that were being used to sort of be hostile to religion. We, we won a first major landmark victory at the Supreme Court on that. This would be now beginning to take those concepts beyond a veterans memorial, beyond a display into our schools, beginning to, to really reinstitute the fact that if this country is a country that is pro-religious expression for individuals, it's not anti. And that's a real cultural change. And so this would be a next major step and opening things up across the country, even beyond coaches, even beyond government officials. Well, if you care about these issues, if you want our right to religious freedom to be defended, if you want members of the military to be able to appropriately and in the right place and time express their faith, if you think coaches should be able to offer a silent prayer on the 50 yard line and just at least live in their faith in the midst of their occupation rather than having to hide it like it's something shameful, you can do just that through your support for our work here at First Liberty. Just go to firstliberty.org and uh, you'll find there firstliberty.org slash military. We'll take you to a page specifically about the military issues we've been talking about today. It'll have more information that you'll find helpful and also an opportunity to support the work here. If this is something you wanna see done this is a way to see that it gets done is through your gift to us. And an important aspect of this is the people that we represent never get a bill from First Liberty. Uh, this is a gift to them. We're able to do that because of our network of volunteer attorneys and because of your support. Kelly, what do you want to add to that? Um, I, I just think it's a unique time uh, right now. I would encourage people to really get involved. Uh, we're seeing people jumping uh, to be part of the army here at First Liberty. A lot of new supporters around the country because they see what's happening. You know, they, they're watching these churches being shut down. They're, they're watching things that make no sense. And they realize there's a real attack on our first freedom. And, uh, and, and we're not, I mean, we're not sure where this is gonna end if people don't stand up and make a difference. So I would say that the timing is so unique, not only because of that, it's sort of the good and the bad. There's these extra attacks, but at the same time, we're getting these victories. Uh, We've won every case we filed during the pandemic. Um, we, we've got this major sea change victory in the Bladensburg Cross case that's starting to have impacts in all kinds of other cases. I, I really do believe we're at the beginning of something really big. And, and if we do our work right, uh, we're about to really watch history change when it comes to religious freedom in a positive way. So there's a lot of chaos, riots, attacks, all this. There's also some really good stuff happening. So it's a great time to sort of join the army because I really feel like we're setting the stage for what our children and our grandchildren are going to have in America. So I would just encourage people. It's a great time to be a part of what we're doing. And it's fun to watch God move. And, and he's definitely moving in the midst of what looks like kind of dark at times. But there's a lot of people standing up and people like Congressman Collins that are fighting for those in the military and we're winning these. We're winning these left and right. We're really starting to get some momentum. All right. Kelly, thank you for sharing with us today. I always appreciate your insights. Thank you, sir. Thank you for hosting and taking care of all the details on this. All right. Happy to do it. And thank you for all of you who are watching. Thank you for going all in with us for religious freedom. We'll see you next week.